thanks to Dr. Meenal for such a nice introduction. Respected chairpersons of this session and dear friends, good afternoon to all of you. At the outset, I am thankful to IAPSM in general and its office bearers in particular for awarding this oration to me and the organizing committee of this conference, especially my personal friend, Dr. Oni Krishnan, to provide me this beautiful state-of-the-art venue to share my thoughts. Dear friends, a recognition from any quarter is always sweet, but it is sweetest when it comes from your peers. So thanks to everyone once again. Now, before I proceed further, a word about Dr. Hacharan Singh, on whose name this oration has been instituted. Dr. Hacharan Singh graduated from Nagpur, did MD Community Medicine from Ames, New Delhi, and served as faculty at Medical College Patiala, where he later became the head of the department. He served as advisor health at Planning Commission for several years, and post-retirement, he worked as advisor to WHO with Nepal government and the UNICEF India. He was, of, he was one of the persons behind the concept of assigning three primary centers to the PSM departments. He was an old-fashioned public health expert with very dashing personality. I'm attending IAPSM conferences since 1982 when I was an MD student. I have distinct memories of seeing Dr. Singh in the conferences held at Jaipur, Gwalior, etc. During the conferences, I have seen him as a very robust, yet charming personality accompanied by young and not so robust, several Sadarjis, obviously who were either his junior faculty or the postgraduate students. He was always sitting in the front row and actively participating in the discussions and in between, saying the encouraging words to youngsters like us. During the banquet dinners, he used to entertain delegates by reciting Urdu Shairi with its equally beautiful English translation. I, along with other juniors, used to see him with great awe that time I did not know that in future an oration will be started in his name and one day I will have the honor of delivering this oration. Before going further, uh, let me put a very powerful disclaimer that views presented here are purely my personal. Learned people sitting in the audience may differ with me as the same data may lead to different interpretations based on one's own perceptions. We all know that how the data is more misused or abused rather than correctly used. Many a times some narratives get built up in the society which need to be analyzed by the public health specialties, uh, specialist to either accept or refute them based on our knowledge and more importantly based upon the facts. According to one school of thoughts, whatever gains we have made in any field, be it economic growth, education, employment, or quality of life, all they got negated by our ever-increasing population. Secondly, the population control achieved so far is not uniform in all states of the society, resulting in the inequality, which percolates in different sectors. Based on these observations, a narration is being built up about the population control. There are voices which say, that our country needs to pursue population control more vigorously by adopting legislative checks and measures. Also to ensure that contraceptive practices are adopted by all, we shall include carrot and stick policy. The strategies should be inclusive and adopted uniformly by everyone to address the problem of inequality. Now let us look at the demographic trends of our country. India's vast and diverse population, its demographic landscape is shaped by a multitude of factors, such as population size, age structure, fertility rates, mortality rates, and the migration patterns. India, as of now, is the most populous country in the world with over 1.4 billion people. It has already overtaken China. However, there is a difference that while China's population is shrinking for the last two years, our population is still on increase. So this sheer magnitude of population, which is still increasing, poses challenges for our social, economic, and environmental development. This is the reason for people to call out for the more vigorous implementation of population control policy, backed up with legislative measures. Then comes the question of age structure. 
Now, India has now exhibited an age structure which is characterized by a large youth population and a growing elderly population. This demographic dividend has contributed a lot to our economic growth in the last two, three decades. This large segment of youth is skilled and educated, in other words, equipped with English speaking and the computer technology and the health providers has made our products and services in demand due to their globally competitive nature. Repatriation of foreign currency by our migrant workforce, be it from US or Europe or even the Middle East, mostly by semi or unskilled workers, has been the single biggest source of revenue to us. However, there are two things to, under, to remember about the demographic dividend. First, it comes with high dependency ratio of children and elderly population with working age population, posing challenges for social welfare, health care and the pension systems. Second is that this dividend will not last forever and once the population control is adopted more vigorously, meaning fewer births and growing adult population due to improved health care, this dividend will also disappear as it is going to happen in case of China. Uh, I will discuss about the declining trend in demography of India in subsequent slides. India's fertility is on decline and its effects will be visible in future. Looking to the data derived from last few census and NFHS, that is National Family Health Survey, 1 to 5, population growth rates are decreasing and of late fewer people are being added during last three census. One thing which I can tell you right now is the proportion of 0 to 6 years of children, which is an indicator of recent fertility, has declined from 15.9% in census 2001 to 13.2% in census 2011. Uh, we all know that census 2021 has not been done due to COVID. So wherever I'm using the data, it is derived from some other sources. Similarly, India has seen a decline in its total fertility rates due to a multitude of factors which are also operating simultaneously. Now look at this slide. It shows a sort of exponential growth of population since 1952. That is a 51 first census was done. Now, the trend line here is a very smooth, straight line and indicates ever-increasing population of India. And it also validates the concern of people. Population has increased from 360 million in 1951 to 1400 million in 2021. That is an increase of almost four times. Now, here if we look at this big figure, things look a bit different. Population growth is better understood by the growth rate of population during 10 year period of between two census, which is commonly referred as decennial population growth rate. And second is the absolute addition of population from one to the next census. The trend line in orange color shows that decennial population growth rate, it increased till 1981 and thereafter started decreasing. Globally, this was the period when population growth was very high everywhere. It is indeed great on the part of the government of that time, that is immediately after independence. Uh, because India was the first country of the world to start official population control program in 1952-53. Mind it, the time government of that time had only access to the interim tables of census 1951. Period was also very conservative if you compare with now. Since 1981, this rate is continuously decreasing. And between 2011 to 21, it was only 15.1% compared to the all-time high 28% between census of 1961 and 71. Second thing is the height of the blue bars, which indicate absolute addition of population uh, between two census. Now, it is very important and interesting to know that this addition has remained more or less stagnant to 182 million, despite the fact in the last three census, despite the fact that the baseline population is increasing with each census. Now, what is total fertility rate or the TFR? It is an important indicator of fertility and roughly means that average number of children a woman is likely to have during her entire childbearing age period. So, TFR is basically or uh, total fertility rate or TFR is basically summation of age-specific fertility rates. Let us look at the age-specific fertility rates for a period of 24 years 
between 1992 and 2016. 1992, I am using the data of NFHS 1, whereas for um, 2016, I am using the data which is available on the census site. Now, age-specific fertility rates, which means number of children born during one year to per 1,000 women of that particular age group. So, this age-specific fertility rate declined in all age groups in this period. You can compare, it has decreased in all age groups between these two periods. However, the decline was maximum in 15 to 19 years from 116 to um, 10. And then in 20 to 24 age group, we had a decrease from 231 to 135. This huge reduction of fertility seen between 15 to 24 years of age is not continued thereafter. Uh, one thing we uh, all should understand that there are two factors for the responsible for decline of this fertility. It is one we call the delayed fertility or the deferred fertility. That means it is shifted to some higher age groups. And second is the deleted fertility where the fertility simply disappears, doesn't take place at all. Now, most of the fertility in 15 to 24 years age group has been deleted fertility and part has been delayed or deferred, which has been passed on to the later age groups. The deleted fertility is largely due to the delayed marriage or delayed consummation of marriage, whereas fertility of 25 to 99 years and onwards is mostly the deferred one. And that is why the reduction in subsequent age group is minimal and can be attributed to mainly contraceptive measures and to some extent to the delayed marriage or delayed birth of the first child. 25, 29 years and onwards, very little difference is seen between the two curves and that is so because of passing on the delayed fertility from the younger age groups. Now, this basically shows a countrywide TFR as per NFHS 5. It was 2.0 for the entire country and it decreased to, uh, from 2.2 in 2015-16 of NFHS 4. Now, TFR of 2.0 means that it was below the population replacement fertility level, which is 2.1. And the same has been validated as the census department website shows that TFR for 2002-03 is as 2.139. That means there has actually been decline and it is around 2. The TFR have declined in all states. However, the inequality can be seen here. Merely looking at the shades of the color, it can be concluded that the TFR is high in northern Hindi-speaking states, while the southern states have low TFR. TFR was particularly high in states like Bihar, Meghalaya, and Uttar Pradesh, where it was around 2 or approaching 2. Countrywide reduction of TFR is due to increasing the as the same factors, age at marriage, delayed consum consummation of marriage, delayed birth of first child, and as such, the preference of fewer children. Delayed childbirth and preference of fewer children has been achieved by extensive use of contraceptives and the liberal abortion laws. At the same time, delayed age at marriage, coupled with increased job and educational opportunities to females, has reduced the gender inequality and has empowered women, thereby making them important in decision making about how many children to have and when to have. I will refer to this slide once again at the end of my presentation. Uh, there are so many socio-demographic and economic factors which influence the TFR. I will use available data to establish the same. This particular diagram is a scatter diagram and shows an inverse correlation between TFR and the per capita state GDP. Now here each dot represents either a state or union territories of the country. So the correlation coefficient is minus 0.68, which validates the age-old slogan that we are studying since our undergraduate days that development is the best contraceptive. In simple words, states or union territories with better financial status are likely to have fewer children, while those who have financially, those states or UTs which are financially not so well, rather vulnerable, will have the more number of children. Now, this shows that how the schooling of women, I'm talking of schooling of women only, influences the TFR. Here, it was an inverse relationship association and the correlation coefficient was very high, minus 0 0.94. That simply means that women with no schooling have highest TFR, that of 2.82, which decreased with the years of schooling and was lowest 1.78 for women with a schooling of 12 years or more. While the earlier figure showed the association between wealth and the TFR, 
um, at the level of state of the Indian territories. Here we look at the wealth of women at individual level. And this association here with the TFR and along with some other proxy indicators of fertility, women falling in the first quintile, that means the first 28% women in terms of the wealth they have, the TFR was 2.6, pretty high. And the mean age at the first childbirth was 20.3 years. And this when compared with the women of the fifth quintile, that means the last 20% women in terms of women and wealth, their wealth, TFR was 1.6. Mean age at the first childbirth was 23.2 years. Now, proportion of teenage pregnancy, another proxy indicator of fertility was 10% in the first quintile of the women and was only 2% the women falling in the fifth quintile. Now, here a comparison has been made between rural and urban areas by using the data of NFHS 1 and NFHS 5. There has been reduction of TFR in both areas, in rural as well as urban. But the reduction is more pronounced in rural areas because to begin with, rural areas had high TFR and therefore, they, therefore there was more scope of reduction. Factors responsible are same in both areas with additional factors in urban areas such as a better educational and job opportunities to women or concept of working couple and the nuclear families and the housing crisis. Also, the contraceptive services and abortion facilities are better and easily available in urban areas. So, considering the fact that the TFR is low in urban areas, a possible reason for declining TFR as a whole in the country is the increasing urbanization in the country. Urbanization was 31% in 2011 census, up from 27% in 2001 census. And as I mentioned, we do not have figure for 2021 census. Otherwise, the urbanization have, must have increased more. Now, this figure shows the decline of fertility during last 25 years in different religious groups. One thing is for sure that fertility has declined in all groups and sharpest decline was seen among Muslims. Obviously, the reason is the same because they had a highest, they had highest TFR to begin with. It is also to be noted that the gaps of TFR among various religious groups are narrowing. But as such, the high, rather highest TFR among Muslims is an area of concern. And it is largely due to northern states which have high TFR irrespective of the reason which I will, religion which I will show in the next slide. Here I have categorized different states based on their TFR. It is interesting to know that in states with high TFR, Every group, every religious group has high TFR, while in states with low TFR, every group has low, T, low uh, TFR. Of course, Muslims have high TFR within every state, but Muslims from states with low TFR have a TFR which is less than the TFR of Hindus from states with high TFR, such as UP and Bihar. I would say that despite the decline observed in the fertility, Muslims as a religious group has high TFR at any point of time and in any territory. But when we make an interstate comparison, it is seen that there are certain other factors which also operate, which are not more, if they are not more important, then at least they are equally important to, uh, than religion to address these inequalities. Now, at this point of time, I would like to say that it is interesting to know that Lakshadweep Islands, which has almost total Muslim population, had the TFR in NFHS 5 only as 1.4. This slide shows the gain in population by every religious group in different census from first census done in 1951 to the last one done in 2011. But for Hindus, all other groups had increased their population size by three to four times. Here too, Muslims had almost four times increase in their uh, population. This also validates the apprehension of people about their increasing population. But we should remember that this also includes migration from our neighborhood country as well as uh, of course, which does uh, influence the demography, but it is more a law and order problem rather than a something to be dealt by social scientists or demographers or health department. At the same time, there is a global perception that minorities, wherever they are, have high fertility than their counterpart. The simple reason is that the minorities are mostly vulnerable in terms of economic, educational and occupational status and also have comparatively limited access to the health facilities. Now here I am highlighting another point, important issue. People's Representation Act was amended last uh, time in 1975 by the government of Mrs. Indira Gandhi. 
whereby the representation of various states in parliament was frozen for the next 25 years. It was done to ensure that the states performing better in population control are not punished for their efforts. Government of Shri Vajpayee in 2000 extended this further for another 25 years. Now it is due for consideration in 2026. As of now, the Hindi-speaking northern states are underrepresented, while southern states are overrepresented. I mean, look at this diagram where you can see that Hindi-speaking states, they constitute 46.5% of population as per the data of 2023, where their representation in parliament is only 41.4%. Similarly, for look at the southern states, they have a proportion of 22.5% population and their representation is 24.3%. So, while northern Hindi speaking states are underrepresented, southern states are overrepresented. If the fresh number of seats are worked out as per the current population, southern states will lose some representation. And then it will be injustice to these states which performed well in population control and amounts to rewarding the states which did not do so well. But at the same time, if it is not done, it will be against the principle of democracy, which runs on the head counts. It is a difficult choice which the current government has to face and sort it out. As such, we have extreme variation in number of electorates in different constituencies. Lakshadi, a small island group of islands, has less than 50,000 voters against 29 lakhs voters in Malkaj, Malkajgiri in Andhra Pradesh. And both members of parliament have equal privileges, rights and the responsibility. An offhand calculation shows that average electorates in UP are 1.8 million per parliamentary seat than 1.6 million Tamil Nadu. Now look at this figure once again. Shades clearly suggest a divide between northern and southern states. I am not referring to a political division, but only talking in terms of prevailing inequality, which to me seems very probable. If it is in terms of the low TFR in southern states, high per capita state GDP in southern states, better health facilities, better health indicators, we all know that the crude birth rate, infant mortality rate, maternal mortality rates, they are less. So, and this all coupled with the less political representation reflect a north and south divide. And this also is to be dealt by the governments, but at the same time it emphasizes, more emphasis is on the area specific actions. Now this is the end note. So what we can say that population is not declining now, but it is on a trend whereby the population stabilization is probable by 2045. And that is the year target year set by government of India. It seems very likely that we will achieve this stabilization by 2045. Youngsters sitting in this audience will definitely in their lifetime see this happening and will also witness the declining trend of population in India. Coercive measures are not required, capital no. In the past, such measures led to setback of the whole program, so much so that the program was renamed, but also resulted in downfall of the government of that time. So also about the carrot and stick policy. There was a suggestion by someone to stop free delivery facilities at government hospitals to a couple after first two deliveries, which thankfully government did not consider. In my opinion, no one from such section who are going to have more than two children will stop planning for a third child just because the free delivery is not available. As such, most of the time, deliveries in our countries are unplanned. So such an action, if done, will alienate vulnerable from such services. They will go to private sectors, increasing the out-of-pocket expenditure and putting them in a debt trap. So what is needed now, first is to ensure the universal availability of contraceptive with some added area specific actions to address the inequalities. Now, second thing is that despite the declining trend of TFR among Muslims, it is still a matter of concern. So specific actions are needed. We all know the polio elimination had the problem in states of UP and PR among the Muslim communities where people were resistant to take the vaccination and how these governments sorted out this issue. They form the teams of people comprised Muslim uh, team comprising of Muslim doctors, Muslim paramedical staff, and these teams went to those areas, talked with the people, and could sort it out. And that is how we could achieve the polio elimination of our country as a whole. So similar type of action is required here. And then general measures, which I have already mentioned, and this socio-economic development, which is 
going to take place will do rest of the job. Finally, an additional message to all of us that we all should respond collectively as IAPSM or individually to every narrative which has the even the remotest relevance to public health. And these responses should be made in a very objective manner and in a very dispassionate manner, backed up with facts and figures. Thank you.